Torque and power are related to each other. Actually, here, let me summarize, write a summary. So we've said torque and power are related to each other. And these two things, torque and power, are directly related to uh, the work done through a cycle, which is, well, related, this is integrals of PDV. So they're related to the thermodynamics, uh, the actual thermodynamic processes inside, uh, inside their device. And now it's then a question, well, we do have another, at least one other thermodynamic quantity we want to relate, and that would be efficiency, right? So what happens to efficiency? Can we relate that to uh, torque, power, the work in the cycle, et cetera? Um, let me clear this up. Okay. So the basic, uh, the basic, the very basic definition of efficiency, this is any thermodynamically meaningful efficiency is a useful output over a required input. All right, so remember, we've said this before, so this is, um, so remember our definition. So I, here I'm just gonna strip, this is for power. This is saying indicated power is equal to brake power plus friction power. If you recall, this was, I was indicated minus friction is equal to brake properties. And we further split the indicated work into gross indicated something uh, plus the pump indicated the indicated pump quantity, which together is equal to the net. This is the indicated net minus the friction is equal to break where the pump and gross are related to, um, our PV diagram where they're, they're they have very specific meaning, meaning in our PV diagram. So here I draw quickly a, uh, sort of a, a real ish looking like this, let's say, so a real ish looking PV diagram, then the, here I'm going to connect my bottom dead centers together. I'm going to connect my top dead centers. I should probably stretch this out like this. So this area here, this is our gross this is the gross indicated, in this case, the gross indicated work done in a cycle. And I'm going to draw it in green out here. Zook, to zook, to zook, and it goes out like that. And in green is the pump. All right. So we want to define the, me uh, the mechanical efficiencies. We're first going to make, define the mechanical efficiency of our engine. So the mechanical efficiency of our engine is going to be equal to uh, my useful output the brake power or the brake work oh. and my required input is the gross indicated power and I, I i we have to be i'm being very specific here this is the gross indicated power not the net indicated power because the pump work is really um well actually it's, it's you could imagine we could have a different device, right? So we could have a, a, a it'd be hard to, to build, but I could have a piston cylinder assembly where I compress, combust, and then push or compress, inject fuel, push. And then when I'm at the bottom, it's gonna stop the piston for a while. And then I'm gonna open these two, two different ports and go and run an external pump. It's actually going to cycle the fluid, like a vacuum cleaner is gonna come and vacuum all of this pet fluid and then inject out, inject back in. Uh, a fresh mixture. Okay, and then we tell the we tell the piston to start going again. Ha ha! And then we go compress, burn, and expand. So the pump is actually a a it's a cost, right? The pump work is so the pump work is a cost that I have to put in at least for uh, a naturally aspirated engine, right? So this is this here is a typical. I'm gonna put this in quote real. PV diagram, I probably should draw a better arrow, PV diagram. This is for a naturally, an A, naturally aspirated engine. So no supercharger, no turbocharger. Um, okay, so that pump could be an external device. It's just that it's, it's because I already have, this is basically what the four stroke cycle is. Um, because I already have the piston going back and forth, well, I may as well use it to clear out to clear out the spent fluid and bring in the fresh, uh, bring it the bring in the fresh 
uh, mixture. So our, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to uh, write this expression for a naturally aspirated engine. This is relatively straightforward. So we said break is equal to, hold on, let me get this straight. So friction is equal to indicated minus break. So that means that it's, uh, the break is going to be equal to the net indicated power minus the friction power over the gross indicated power. And the net indicated power, this is the uh, gross indicated plus the pump. So this is going to be equal to the indicated gross plus the pump indicated power minus the friction power divided by the gross indicated power. Um, now we have to be careful here so that uh, we're not completely, well, we're sort of mixing our thermodynamic, uh, uh, our thermodynamic definitions with, uh, with like a, a physical definition where we keep, tra tra keep track of the sign. So the friction power uh, here is a, is a negative sign because it's, it's the friction power is the amount of power that is going into the parasite. So that's actually being dissipated by the friction. It's not uh, the thermodynamic definitions where positive power is power going to the gas or out of the gas. But um, uh, for the pump indicated power, we have kept that definition where there's a positive sign because the pump, uh, the indicated pump power is, uh, let's see, it is negative in this case because it's done to the gas, right? Or in other words, it's in the PV diagram, that portion is cycling counterclockwise. So let me just add a bunch uh, of, uh, what do we call these, sort of absolute value sign. So the gross indicated, gross indicated, this is, this doesn't matter. And it's just here that I have to be careful to take out the plus and we're going to put a negative sign and put the absolute. And now that is only true for, so in this form, it's only for a naturally aspirated engine. So now we get sort of a, a new definitions of, of mechanical efficiency. It's one minus all the losses, right? The friction losses plus, I'm going to put the absolute uh, signs plus the pump power divided by the gross power. There we go. Oops, eta m. Now this is for naturally aspirated engine. Now, if we have a supercharger or a turbocharger, things are a little bit different. I have to be, basically, I have to be a little bit careful about what uh, what I define as, um, I have to be a little bit careful about what we define as going into uh, which direction. Um, so for a, here we, I've written it out. This is for, uh, for a supercharged, well, I've written it out sort of in a, in a general form that would, actually, let me go back and let me just write the specific form. So let's write this out for a supercharger. So now it's gonna be equal to, actually here, let me just undo a bunch of things. There we go. So let me just erase, let me erase this part. I'm gonna keep my scribbling on the top. All right, so now let's redo this for a supercharged engine. Uh, now my PV diagram is gonna be, it's gonna look a little bit different. Here we're gonna do this. So now we're going to redo this for a supercharged engine. So for a supercharged engine, uh, let's see, we're going to exhaust. Oh, yeah, sure. I'll put it in black. Exhaust, but then we have power coming in, zoop, and then we compress, come down. Wow, that's not a very, like this. Okay, let me just erase this extra line here. Oh, there we go. Good enough. 
So a supercharged engine like this, and now it's zoop, our pump work is positive. So supercharged engine. So for a supercharged engine, again, we have the brake power is going to be equal to the indicated net minus the friction power divided by the gross power equal to. But now I have to be a little bit careful. Um, I'm going to have the, the, let's see, the indicated net. This is going to be equal to the indicated gross power plus the pump work. And here, let me start putting absolute signs. And now the pump work is positive because it's going clockwise in the, um, what do you call this, in the, uh, uh, in the PV plane. And then I have a minus sign. And now I'm going to split the friction into two. I'm going to have the friction. I'm going to call this W dot F star and minus W dot F sub. I'm going to divide all of this by the gross indicated power. Okay. Oh, let me put a bunch of absolute value signs. Okay. This is the, what is this called? This is the gross indicated power. So you would have, so that's the amount of, that's the amount of power that's generated by the gas as it gets compressed and expanded. This is the pump work, which is now positive. Uh -huh. Yeah, be a bit careful. And actually here, um, I'm going to take out the star just to be consistent with the, the I call it prime. Um, so this is the pump work, which I'm getting from displacing the gas. But now there's this pre there's supercharging. So the pressure is higher in the intake. So that actually displaces, that actually gives me a net amount of work into the gas. It actually gives me a, a net amount of work into my system. Um, and then I have the, the W dot F prime. These are the, these are sort of the normal friction losses. So the actual parasites, coolant pump, fuel pump, everything, the radio, the air conditioning and so on. And then I have this, the, the weird part of the friction losses, which is the supercharger losses. This is the amount of power that I have to put into the supercharger, except I'm getting some of it back, right? Cause the amount of power that I put into the supercharger goes into the intake flow and then it comes back into my piston in the form of the pump power. Okay. Um, so that's going to be equal to W dot is this the gross power minus, oh, I should put absolute signs actually here. Let me, just because I'm running out of room, I'm just going to erase them and rewrite them. So I'm going to combine, actually what I'm going to do in the next manipulation is I want to combine these two terms together. So the amount of work, the amount of pump work minus the amount of work that went into the supercharger, that's the supercharger losses. Loss supercharger, right? That's the amount of work I put into the supercharger that I got back into the pump power. What I didn't get back is just is sort of is mostly gone. I mean, some of it probably went into some of it went into, I'm going to put a little dash line there. So some of it, some of that work that I put in also went into the growth power, but some of it also came back from the pump power. So it's kind of, uh, it's kind of weird, but the growth power, uh, the gross indicated power sort of accounts for whatever portion it got. So I just want to be careful about not double counting power. So now the pump work and the uh, supercharger so these two together is the losses from the supercharger. And then if I tack on, so this is, this should be a net, it should be a net negative. Oh, absolute value, right? Cause I, I had better be getting less work back out of the supercharger than I put in. Otherwise I have a magic machine that I put some work and power in and it gives me more power. This would be screw the engine. I'm just going to put that in place. Okay. And then, so if I compile all of these three terms together, which is basically the normal losses plus the losses of the supercharger, and I get something that I call W dot F 
star. This is my notation. This is not a standard notation. So this is the actual losses. So this is the actual losses, the actual real losses, plus the actual real losses from the supercharger. There's friction in the bearings of the supercharger. Like that actual compressor itself has losses. And indeed, if we if we were to go, so in the next page, oh, it's sort of, I'm sorry, there, it's overwritten. Um, just take my word for it, I'll cycle th through it afterwards. This becomes our, um, this becomes our equation for uh, the supercharger version. So actually, let me, I would write it like this. Oh, take this away. And then I would say, uh, oh, this is now no longer a plus sign. It's going to be a negative sign. The actual real losses. Yay. Okay. So this works for a supercharger. Now, so let's think about the, what is it now? This is a, well, actually here, let's just, let me just note one thing before I go and do the turbocharger. So these terms here, this is the expected, uh, sort of the expected term, right? That's the amount of, that's the amount of energy that has come from that has been liberated by uh, the chemical. That's a the, that's the amount of mechanical energy that I have extracted from the chemical potential from the the internal energy of the gas, which has been augmented by the chemical potential. So that's the amount of energy that I'm getting out of the like that's the amount of energy I've been able to convert from thermal out to uh, from thermal out to mechanical. These are actual friction losses. So it's just that before, essentially, I write it in this way uh, because before there was a, a there was sort of a, a little bit of a murky area, right? This net indicated power gets a boost. This is higher than it's actually it's equal to the the chemical energy I'm able to extract plus more plus the pump work, which is kind of weird. And then in these losses, now these are inflated. These are actual real chemical or, or mechanical losses, plus an amount of power that I've put into uh, that I've actually put in uh, um, inside the compressor, but I'm getting some of it back. So I'm, I'm sort of raising both of these terms together. I like this form because now the losses are all actual real losses, but it's 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 actual losses in um, I've sort of I've dissociated uh, uh, that that sort of cyclic run of power, when I'm putting power into the compressor that comes back through the pump or through the pump work. And now you see that this is um, actually the, the mechanical efficiency of the engine. When I put in a, a supercharger, it does not raise its mechanical efficiency. It actually lowers it, right? If I'm under the assumption that I have the same amount of indicated gross power, then I actually get a lower mechanical efficiency because I'm adding parts that rub against each other. I'm adding bearings and, and screw compressors and so on inside the path to raise the pressure of the incoming. And that work is coming from the engine. Uh, what I am doing is that for a given engine size, I can pack in more, I can pack in more uh, mass and get a boost of power. Aha. This is not insignificant. Okay. Now let's look at a turbocharger. So I'm going to Uh, okay, so let's look now at a turbocharger. Turbocharged engine. And aha. So now it's going to be actually that the, my drawing looks very close. I mean, the, 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 the descent of pressure when I open the exhaust valve might be a little bit less severe because now there's a there's a turbine that is opposing uh, that's opposing that decrease um, so that might keep the pressure higher for a little bit longer but these are sort of second order effect I wouldn't dwell about about these too much there's a there's a higher order effect um, which is the well which we'll see in a moment so there's a more important effect I'm gonna erase this guy these part of the equations here okay 
So now we have the break power over the uh, gross indicated power. We're going to split the break power into the indicated net minus the friction losses. This is going to be equal to, I'm going to break further the indicated gross plus the pump work minus the friction losses over W dot I G. Okay. Now, let me put the absolute size. So this is an absolute uh, value. I can just put it straight because the growth indicated power had better be positive. Otherwise, I haven't made an engine. So I can put positive there. And those friction losses, those are still so far, those are normal friction losses. Remember, a turbocharger does not extract, uh, a, the turbocharger is not powered by the engine itself. It's not, the turbocharger is not powered by the crankshaft of the engine. There we go. So I'm going to put an absolute value. This is actually, this is actually the, the these are, I'm going to call these true losses. Right? This is coming out of the crankshaft and it's going to air conditioner, coolant pumps, the usual, the usual suspect. But now I have the pump power, which is positive. That's going to go up. And now I have a choice. I, I leave the plus because the pump power actually is positive for a supercharged engine. So now I have, I have a choice. I can, well, the pump power is it's sort of an ideological choice. So the pump power is a positive value. So while well, I could say, well, I'm going to lump positive into positive, these are, it's, it acts as, if, as though it's, it's raising the amount of, it's raising the amount of, uh, of, uh, of power that is supplied of mechanical power that is supplied to me that I can use in order to produce brake power, or I could use it, you know, Alternately, I could I could sort of lump these two terms together and say it, it's it's reducing the number of losses. I I, I don't really want to look at it. But the the point is, I'm going to erase this. Oh, so the the point though is that if you look at, oops. I'll put this back to black. So if you look at the, the, the positivity and the negativity of the terms, now for the same amount of gross indicated power, my turbocharger actually raises the mechanical efficiency of my device. And why is that? It's because this, oh, it's because the, the power term, the pump power term, just waiting for my pen to come back to life. There we go. So the pump power term here, this is not given or it's not taken from the crank. This is power previously wasted. So, I mean, it is powered by the engine because the piston cylinders, they're the ones creating the high pressure gas. So yes, it's created by the, it's powered by the engine because that, that high pressure gas has to come from the combustion ultimately and so on. But I used to throw that away. I used to just open the exhaust valve and let it vent out into the atmosphere. And I'd get this little puff of, I get this little puff of pressure coming out. And now I say, well, instead of wasting it, I'm going to recover it and use that to then power to, where am I going to put that mechanical work back in? Well, one easiest, one easy spot is to actually just drive a compressor and put that power back into the intake flow and have the intake gas come in. And now I have more work available. So that actually the supercharger, uh, sorry, the, excuse me, the turbocharger actually raises uh, the mechanical efficiency of my device. I am using work that I was previously wasting away and reusing it, or not reusing it, but I'm, I'm using work or power that I was previously wasting away in order to extract it and do actual mechanical work. So there's two ways, uh, there's two ways that I can use this effect. Um, traditionally, I'm gonna put air quotes around this. So traditionally, the way people get excited about it is that I had a turbocharged engine so I would get more power, right? When the when the, I would start to accelerate, and then when the turbo kicked in, bam! I would go off, and like this gave me extra oomph. Okay, that's one way to use it. Another one is to say, well, I I want a more efficient engine, 
So I need a car, you know, I, I want a Honda Civic that has 120 horsepower of power. And adding a turbocharger gives me an extra, I'm making numbers out of thin air here, but it gives me an extra 15% efficiency. I doubt it's a high. Well, I don't know. Uh, uh, let's see, 10%. It's giving me an extra 10% efficiency. So I would get, what did I say? I said 120 horsepower. So now I have 132. Well, I could, I could make my engine smaller. So I could make a base engine that has your, let's compute it properly. So I want it to end at 120. I want that to be 100, but I only need 90% of it. So I can do, actually, I can do 120 divided by 1.1. So I could do it. I could take an engine that has 109.1 horsepower. And when I increase it, that's my base engine without the turbocharger. And then when I put in the turbo, it kicks up the horsepower to 120. So what I've done is I've created an engine that has the same power requirement that, uh, or it, it outputs the same amount of power that my requirements call for, but I've done this by using less fuel. So instead of asking for an extra oomph and like just flex my muscle, look, I got a good car. I can, I can speed up past everybody. What I've done is I've created a car that is more efficient. Yeah, interesting. Okay. So if we go through, this is the, the derivation for the supercharger and so on. Uh, okay. Um, so the mechanical efficiency depends on popping losses. So I've been talking about all this uh, as a, a, a matter of um, sort of at a fixed point or at a fixed design point wide open throttle. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not running at idle where I'm trying to kill the power, but obviously if we raise the pumping losses by closing the throttle, then the amount of uh, power or work that is um, consumed in the pump work is very high and also reduces the gross indicated work. And at these two basically, so A plus C and, and B plus C will actually match each other so that the only amount of power that I have left is just enough to beat the friction so that the engine doesn't stop, so it doesn't move, but it actually just keeps sustaining itself. But then it's not moving the car forward because there's not enough um, there's not enough power coming out to accelerate with any kind of um, with any kind of, uh, of uh, fast acceleration. Um, let's see. So typical automobile engine efficiency is between seventy five percent and. 90%, yeah, wide open throttle, low speed, it's very high efficiency, okay. Let's see. Um, aha, there's different engine efficiencies. So now we, so that's the, the, this was our mechanical efficiency. Now we wanna talk about, well, other kinds of, cause so the mechanical efficiency is actually only looking, so if I think of this as a, a system diagram, so the, uh, I have an amount of internal energy that's pressure and temperature, right? After combustion, my gas is at a high pressure and temperature. We go through sort of, I'm gonna call this gas dynamic or thermodynamic process. Um, and then we end up with mechanical energy. That's right, we've imparted it to, the, the, the volume is growing. So now we have mechanical power that we can get out. Oop, I drew a box there. I guess I should draw a box everywhere. So mechanical power. And then we go through actual friction and uh, movement. And then we get out the mechanical power, but the brake mechanical power. Uh, yes, so all of these, this is what we just calculated as our mechanical, uh, no, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm trying not to get, so we went from the gross indicated power, actually that is from here. So these two, so going from the mechanical power through friction and movement, we have the brake mechanical, that's our mechanical efficiency. Let me put it in red mechanical efficiency. 
Uh, now we're at, now we are looking at the combustion efficiency. Aha. So this one is actually even, so this one is looking at, so again, thermodynamic definition of efficiency, useful output over required input. So this, in this particular case, we have on the, on the top, our actual or our, our useful output. And this is kind of, this is always confusing because our useful output is actually an input. So that's the amount of, that's the equivalent amount of heat that the gas has ready to raise its pressure and temperature. That's the, the equivalent Q in to the gas. Here, these are combustion processes. What is the source? The source is the theoretical maximum chemical potential energy. That's this bottom term there. That's the mass of fuel multiplied by QHV is something called a heating value. The heating value of a fuel is, well, it, by definition, it's the amount of chemical potential energy per unit mass of fuel, not of mixture, just the fuel part, that is available to do, um, or that is, sorry, that is stored in the chemical bonds of the fuel. So that's the, well, that's the heating, I'll call this the heating value. You're not getting all of this out into uh, internal energy. You're getting a bit less. There's incomplete combustion. Uh, there's, um, yes, one main thing is that there's incomplete combustion. Um, so if we consider this part, that is the combustion A to C. That's the combustion efficiency here. Interesting. If I go from the internal energy, PT, to the mechanical power, that's the gas dynamic process, that's probably, I want to keep this, uh, actually, hold on, let me just erase. Let me erase these scribblings. Oh, uh, let's see, the thermal efficiency, aha. So the thermal efficiency, it's a so other kind of efficiency. Now the thermal efficiency is a, that's actually the efficiency that you know. That's the efficiency if you look here. Well, that's the efficiency we've been calculating in our ideal cycle, right? It's the amount of work per cycle or power per cycle um, divided by the actual heat input that is uh, transferred to the gas. Yeah, that's right. So the thermal efficiency would be here. Yeah, I'm just going to go, uh, I'm going to go back up one slide. There we go. Just so I can, I can write on my scribblings at the bottom. So the thermal efficiency is this process here. Eta thermal. And actually would define two. So what I wrote, this would be the indicated thermal efficiency. The break thermal efficiency, I'm going to switch color, in purple, is there. Eta thermal break. So if I consider the amount of break power available for the amount of Q in, that's the break thermal efficiency. If I consider the amount of indicated power that's available, then that's the indicated thermal efficiency. Okay, here, I'm, I'm going to clear all the drawings because it's getting a bit messy. There we go. So the thermal efficiency by definition. So here's the, uh, on a rate basis and it's the Q in. So is the, is the, uh, required input and that's the, so M F Q H V that's the theoretical amount of, uh, heat that is locked into the chemical bonds. If I multiply that by the combustion efficiency, that gives me the equivalent amount of Q in that comes in. Um, it's, a, and then we, and then it says we can give them in terms of break or indicated, uh, values. And actually these two are related by, well, if we divide one by the other, you'll find that it's the break work divided by the indicated work and that the ratio of the break thermal efficiency and indicated thermal efficiency is just mechanical efficiency. Um, so indicated thermal efficiencies are 50 to 60%, really high. Break thermal efficiency are about 30%. Aha, much closer to what we actually expect for sort of the overall uh, package. 
Yes. So the process is, this is what I was saying, the process is gas dynamic or gas expansion. Okay. Engine efficiency, or what we call fuel conversion efficiency, um, that is the, that's the overall, that's, well, that's the, yeah, that's the overall efficiency. So if I, it's the amount of work that comes out, whoops. It's the amount of work that comes out over the theoretical, like the chemical potential energy in the chemical bonds, or on a rate basis, this is the amount of power that comes out. I can always go from, uh, I can always go from a, a rate basis to like a work basis, right? This would be the amount of work that's say per cycle in kilojoules. Well, on the bottom, this would be the mass of fuel in kilograms used in a cycle. So it's basically the, the volume, the displacement volume multiplied by the initial density. Um, if I do this on a rate basis, well, QHV is just a constant. It's a property of a, it's actually a property of a fuel. You can look it up in a table. So uh, I can take the derivative of the stuff on top, the derivative of the stuff on the bottom that changes. And now this becomes the rate at which I'm putting fuel into the engine. And on the top, this becomes the rate at which I'm doing work or the power. So I can always go from, I don't know how to call it, but like a, a, a per mass basis to a per time basis or a rate basis. Okay, so the uh, engine efficiency or the fuel conversion efficiency is going from uh, power or going from amount of heat uh, available as potential energies, chemical potential energy, to amount of actual mechanical work extracted. Um, again, we could define two, so we could have the break uh, fuel conversion efficiency, comma B, or I could have the indicated fuel conversion efficiency. This would be the indicated work over M dot F, M dot F QHV. Um, yes. So remember, let's see. Okay, so remember this specific fuel consumption. This was M dot F over W dot. And I said, this is, this is actually very close to an efficiency. I said the SFC sort of goes like one over the efficiency. Yeah, it's just that it still has units. It's not a, it's not a unitless, uh, it's not a unitless, um, oops, it's not a, a, a unitless uh, quantity, right? This has, this has typical units or grams per kilowatt hour. Yes, yeah, sort of typical units that we give, but it's very close. Oh, actually, look at that. It's, it's locked in here is the specific fuel consumption. M dot F over W, or it's one over, this is one over SFC. So I can write the fuel conversion efficiency is just one over specific fuel consumption times QHV. So actually the specific fuel consumption is the inverse of efficiency or fuel conversion efficiency up to a constant, up to the heating value of the fuel. Awesome. Um, let's clear our drawing so we can move forward. There we go. Um, there's one last, uh, one last thing that we call efficiency, even though it's not really an efficiency, it's the volumetric efficiency. And I say it's not really an efficiency uh, because scientists, academics, thermodynamicists, uh, when we say the word efficiency, we like it to go from zero to one. In industry, actually in, in different, in specific fields, this, this happens in academic fields as well. Um, People tend to overuse certain terms. And so now we talk about volumetric efficiency is the actual amount of air that is entrained into, uh, into the cylinder during the intake phase over what we call theoretical air. So theoretical air is the displacement volume multiplied by, this is the ambient density around you. This is the outdoors, uh, this is the, the, the outside the car. So the, the bottom, the theoretical air, that's the amount of, um, that's the amount of mass that you would be able to get into a cylinder if there was no pre-compression, so no supercharging, no turbocharging, and there was also no losses. There's basically like no valve, there's just magic. You just, your, 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 your intake process was a scoop the piston would come up and then it would just deploy an arm and go whoop and just grab a scoop of, of air 
but just no no actual losses so no no viscous losses no friction no no pressure drop inside pipes nothing so for a naturally aspirated engine because there's pressure drops uh the the volumetric efficiency is usually well actually they both work so there's pressure drops so that tends to drop the density and there's also temperature increases because the the block the the engine block is hot so the gas comes by it heats up and when you raise remember the ideal gas law p is equal to rho rt so if i'm at rho a and then i decrease the pressure well at constant temperature that means that i'm also decreasing the density but then if i heat up the air at constant pressure and I raise the temperature, that also means I'm decreasing the density. So both effects actually play against you. So for a naturally aspirated engine, the density coming in is gonna be lower than the density ambient. So the volumetric efficiency will be less than one. So eta V is less than one for naturally aspirated. This is not true for supercharged and turbocharged. So it can be greater than 100% for turbocharged and supercharged engines uh, because you you've got a compressor ahead that raises the uh, that raises the the density uh, well that raises the pressure uh, ahead which is naturally going to raise the density and so you actually have a higher density you can reach a higher density than ambient and so you're actually inducting to be the proper word is you're you are inducting more mass than uh, theoretical air. So this is not really, I don't like to use the word efficiency always irks me as an academic because an efficiency should be divided by sort of some kind of theoretical maximum, which is not the case here. This is not the theoretical maximum. This is not the maximum amount of air that you could ever get in. You can get more if you have pre-compression. Just happens to be the theoretical maximum for a naturally aspirated engine. Um, so that covers efficiencies. Actually, these are all, uh, that's, a, that's actually a number of parameters, but that covers all of the, uh, the different efficiencies. Um, but we still have more ratios to cover. Uh, so some of them, uh, well, one class is the air-fuel ratio or its little cousin, the fuel-air ratio, which is just one over the air-fuel ratio. Right? So don't, this is not a over F, well, it's a ratio. This is the minus one applies to this whole thing. This. So the air fuel, whoops. So the air fuel ratio is just the amount of air that you are uh, taking into your cylinder compared to the amount of fuel. Uh, so this is on a mass basis, this is on a rate basis. Uh, the fuel air ratio is just the opposite. So it's the amount of fuel mass over the amount of air mass. And remember, this is so the one thing to remember, these are pretty self obvious, but these are not mole ratios. These are mass ratios. Okay. Minor point. You're just going to get a somewhat rather different number if you use ratios of moles. It's not obvious now that it's not obvious now what would make you want to do this. But when we start to talk about combustion, uh, you, you will get that sort of that urge to just use the molds. You shouldn't do that. Okay, what are typical values? So actually, again, this is, uh, so the ideal air to fuel ratios for hydrocarbon engines is somewhere around 15. They all vary like 14.2 to 16 point something. It depends on the actual molecules used. If you're you know, burning methane or octane or heptane or pentane or, or dodecane in the case of diesel. Um, for spark ignited engines, the, the the window of what you can burn is much tighter. It's basically because you have to burn a mixture that is able to burn on its own. You give it a spark to start it, but then afterwards the combustion happens on its own. So if the ideal ratio is somewhere around 15, you're only able to burn in a somewhat limited window around it, like 12 to 18. We have tricks, uh, there are modern tricks about, about shaping and pre-combustion chambers and so on and uh, stratified engines, so adding a little bit of more fuel in one particular zone so that the combustion starts because if you can if you can start a vigorous combustion then you can propagate it we'll talk about this in in further videos 
but overall the window of what you can burn is pretty tight. For compression ignition, aha, now that's different. You can dump in a lot of um, you can dump in a lot of air, and you can burn very. Uh, actually, here's a good place to introduce a word. So, the ideal air to fuel ratio is about fifteen to one. This is the air fuel ratio. So, if you have less fuel than what is ideal, that is, you have too much air, then it would be you know, if the ratio is. 20, 25, well, anything above 15, then this is what we call fuel lean. And if you have less air than what is ideal, so this would be a lower air fuel ratio, so six, uh, eight, 10, so anything less than 15, less than ideal, then this is what we call fuel rich. Just like ground meat, right? It's, it's, Lean meat is one that doesn't have much fat. So fuel lean is one that doesn't have much fuel. Fuel rich is one that has a lot of fuel compared to what is ideal. And what's ideal is actually given by chemistry. Um, so for compression ignition engines, uh, you can go, and you'll notice that this starts, so ideal is over here, 15. So we're going over, we want to burn fuel lean. There's, there's reasons for this. Um, and for a compression ignition, the ratio, the ratio get, can get huge. I mean, look for spark ignition, you know, 18 is sort of, it's pretty lean. It's, it's far out to what you would want to burn. And, you know, for compression ignition, you can, because there's no, it doesn't have to propagate a flame. The air is already hot enough that as soon as you drop fuel into it, it's going to start burning. It's going to start reacting and burning with the air. So you can add. Yeah, you can add a lot of you, know, you can add a lot of air and then just drop the fuel that you want to get the amount of heat release, and it can be it can be very uh, very lean and still uh, and still operate properly because you're not relying on a propagating flame. You're not relying on a combustion process. Every little drop of fuel that comes in basically is is already has the potential to burn on its own. Okay, and then we can, this is sort of the end of this deck of slides. So now we can combine, actually, and you can do this ad nauseum, sort of there's a, there's a very large number of uh, um, combinations you could do. So now we can combine the equations for torque and power with the efficiencies and so on. And then you can get all sorts of different combinations. This is mean effective pressure, taking into account the fuel conversion efficiency, volumetric efficiency, air fuel ratio, and so on. Uh, we can go and there's a, oh, yep. Yeah. Sorry. So these are what one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I guess maybe eight uh, here. So there's a number of there's a number of different combinations one could uh, come up with. And now there's and then on top of this, there are extra parameters uh, that people like to um, use or keep track of. So uh, beginning here, we have sort of the, the actually the some of them might, might be repeats from before. So we have volumetric efficiency, some power related to, uh, let's see, this is power related to fuel conversion efficiencies and so on. This is the torque and power, we're gonna go down. And then we have some stuff that's um, kind of interesting. Here we have the power output divided by the piston area. This is something called specific power. Here we have it again. So we have two different versions of uh, this specific power. Let's keep going. Uh, well, I guess the, yeah. So SP specific power is work divided by area. In this case, if you don't qualify it, then it is, uh, you would assume that it's the brake power. This is OPD output per displacement. Output being brake power per displacement per VD. So these now these ratios are not it's not like efficiencies they're not unitless ratios these very much have units left over uh, SV specific volume well that's actually the inverse of the output per displacement and the specific weight this is the weight of the engine divided by the brake power so these different numbers are again these are are going to vary more than stuff like the mean effective pressure uh, but probably less than well definitely uh, less than, 
say, looking at just the brake power, for example. So you can get more information about um, the sizing of your engine and how they relate to each other. And especially like the, if, you, if you have a design of sort of a base engine and then you know what its specific power is and you're not actually getting, you're not getting exactly the, the right amount of power where you could, you could scale that engine if you need you know, three, 5% more power then I could scale all of the different parameters by the area of the piston and then try to scale the engine and the other and see how the other parameters would uh, react to changes in specific power. Um, the inverse of specific weight is power density. Okay. And I think that is, oh, that is very close. So we have a few, I keep forgetting about these. So we have a, a, a few last, oops. We have a few last uh, number, which are uh, emissions, uh, emissions related number. Uh, so the specific emissions, these are, so mass flow rate of pollutant divided by the power output. Um, oops. And so these are, well, these are extremely important to, well, these are extremely useful to characterize the emissions, to characterize the emissions characteristic, to characterize how much pollutants are emitted by your engine. Um, it would be, uh, it would be, sort of dangerous to make regulations based on emissions of pollutants. So if I said, if I put a regulation that said, um, you can only, any engine can only emit a maximum of this mass flow rate of NOx, then that would be very dangerous sort of, uh, uh, that would be very dangerous or society wise, because essentially what that would do is it would cap the size of engines then one way to get out of this is I would make ever, ever smaller engines, uh, but then that would completely preclude me from, from uh, uh, or preclude us from actually performing certain, you know, uh, certain processes which just require a large amount of mechanical power. So it makes more sense to limit sort of a, a ratio, uh, uh, it's not dimensionless, but a, a ratio of, um, um, of these things. So I'm saying like, I can't have more emissions of NOx per kilowatt of power. And now that is, that makes more sense. So now that's saying that you're, you're, you're basically asking for like a, an environmental efficiency. Um, and then you, and then you slowly squeeze it. So as time goes by, then you keep going back with industry partners and you say, well, uh, this is the target that you've reached. So now we're going to we're going to have stricter emission rules. You're going to have to find ways to design your engine so that you you produce you know five percent less, and then we're going to keep squeezing you until we get closer and closer to zero. Um, we can then uh, we can define so I guess another evaluation method. This is the emission index, which would be now this is non-dimensional. This is the mass flow rate of a pollutant over the mass consumption of fuel. So an engine that produces less NOx is one that has a lower rate of emission of NOx for the same rate of consumption of fuel. Um, and so we can also put, we can put regulations on these numbers. And this sort of covers, yeah, we have the same example we've seen before, and this covers all of the, um, all of the parameters and uh, non-dimensional parameters uh, relevant to engines.